I think we've all had the experience of engaging in conversation with people who we know are smarter than us. Uh, it's an interesting experience. You're speaking to someone and you know, ooh, this person, this person, this person's sharp, you know? I remember having a, a conversation with a particularly uh, smart gentleman. And even though I was talking about my topic and this topic was something he knew nothing about, you can tell by the way they analyze and the questions they ask, they're asking the right questions, you know? Uh, like, the very simple question, how do you know that? Where do you know that from? Or, well, if you said this, then why are you saying that now? So just, even though they don't know your topic, they can tell you're actually being incoherent or you've said something here and now you're kind of gone off on a tangent without proving what you're saying at all. So just a person who's very, very astute. And it's just very interesting to see how, how the person who's actually smart doesn't actually have to know lots about the particular topic, but just know how to look at a topic, know how to analyze the topic, right? They don't necessarily have to be the one who's talking all the time, but the person who's, who knows how to listen, right? So it's not always the person who's doing and the person who's making, but the person who knows how to listen can actually be the, the, the smarter one or the more influential one. Often, in fact, there's a good old-fashioned Irish farmer expression, say not until you hear more. It's the kind of thing you just kind of sit and listen and just wait for the other person to kind of trip themselves up kind of thing. Uh, say not until you hear more. But this reminds me a little of, of, of Our Lady, uh, where Our Lady, she's not the kind of one who comes in and just barrages you with words and barrages you with just this kind of avalanche of, 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 of talking, right? Our Lady has this, this deep-seated wisdom, this deep-seated knowledge of the Lord, where she doesn't have to just kind of continuously talk, uh, but she knows how to listen. So yesterday we were talking about Our, our Lady's foundation, the kind of the, the feet that Our Lady stands on, right? The, the foundation of anything sets it up. I mean, if, you're, if your feet are off, if you fall in arches, it kind of throws out your knees, which then throws out your hips, which then throws out your spine to compensate for all the rest, and you end up a bit wobbly. Uh, Whereas if your foundation is good, everything else sits better. Our Lady's foundation was her humility. But I feel today it's important to, to balance out that fact that uh, Our Lady, yes, she's humble and she expects everything from the Lord, but we shouldn't think either that she was just entirely passive and just kind of got blown her merry way to, to, to be Queen of Heaven without ever collaborating with that grace. So Our Lady... Yes, she's full of grace, not full of herself. And, and the reason I suppose yesterday I, I wanted to emphasize that is that today, even when we talk about saints, we, we often talk about them in terms of them realizing themselves and becoming all that they could be. And they pushed on hard. And uh, St. Francis, who loved nature, and he overcame the, 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 the difficulties of the time and the opposition from the hierarchy at the time, and he pushed on through and became this great saint. And we kind of forget that, yep, it's, it's God's grace in him, God's grace in him first and foremost. But yes, he works with the grace. But we shouldn't think it's just all human effort and you know, human ability, because if you, if you think of it in those terms, then what's Our Lady? She didn't write any books, she didn't overcome any empire of the time, she didn't, you know, if you think Our Lady then did nothing significant. So we, we, we shouldn't misunderstand uh, our Lady's greatness or the greatness of the saints. Their greatness is their reliance on God. Their greatness is the fact that they're full of grace, that they're, or at least in varying degrees, Our Lady, in, 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 a, in the most perfect degree possible for a human being. Uh, but they collaborate with God. So it's God's grace which they collaborate with. So it's not all God in the sense that they're just entirely passive and just kind of get blown along the path of sanctity, but it's not all them either. Otherwise, they don't need God, which that, that would just make no sense. Uh, so it's, it's God's grace in them, which they collaborate perfectly with, or which they collaborate in varying degrees with. But yeah, as saints, obviously, they're going to be much better than your average Joe Soap. So uh, it's not necessarily that, that, as I say, that they have to do great things exteriorly. You think of, you know, you're, you're a Saint Joseph, again, in this year, St. Joseph, <clears throat> didn't write any books, uh, didn't work any miracles during uh, his life that we're aware of, and yet's the protector of the church, you know, a, a wonderful, powerful saint, St. John the Baptist, actually, <clears throat> who the Lord himself says, no greater man is born of woman than uh, St. Than John the Baptist, but yet we don't hear of any miracle that he works.
he baptizes. He's, he's a, lives a very ascetic life, absolutely. But we shouldn't misunderstand what greatness is in God's sight. God gives you the grace, and he asks you to work with it. One little point, then I'll come back to our lady. Uh, interestingly, God gives the grace, and we're supposed to work with it. We might think of the Our Lady or saints in general and say, well, they were, they were blessed. I mean, they, were, they received so much grace. Our Lady was preserved from all sin of original sin, and so many of the saints received maybe locutions or visions, uh, and I don't. So yeah, they receive more, but, I mean, they had all these supernatural experiences, so, so why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they become saints? I mean, maybe they had an advantage. And we might forget that we received the Eucharist. Or, like, when you consider the Old Testament saints, they received maybe uh, so an anointing, some of the Old Testament prophets, maybe, or the kings. We've received baptism, a greater anointing than any of the Old Testament kings or prophets. When you think of it, like, a, this baptism brought into Christ's body, you know, washed stain washed clean of all stain of original sin. It's made, made, made an adopted child of God. This, this grace that we have is absolutely phenomenal. The fact that we can become a living tabernacle, uh, a place where God can dwell. We have received, we receive all the grace that we need if we will work with it. We receive maybe even greater graces than, than many of the, the, the saints of the past. Maybe even like the, the first millennium, for example, where, where regular confession wouldn't have been a thing. It was the Irish monks that brought that into the church to have this, this more, more regular practice of confession. <clears throat> but for many, it was a almost once-in-a-lifetime experience. You have confession near the end of your life, hoping that you'll kind of, that you'll judge that particular hour fairly well, because if you, if you overshoot it, you might miss it altogether. And if you live too long after confession, then you've got a whole load of sins before you die. Anyway, uh, so we've received so many graces that we can and should work with, that we shouldn't be in any way envious of the saints of those who have gone before us. We have received and we do receive everything that we need to become saints. <clears throat> and so our Blessed Lady, then who, her foundation, yes, is her humility, her openness to God. Her, her being full of grace, not full of herself. But then she works perfectly with that. And so now from heaven, uh, St. Louis Marie de Montfort has a, a, a powerful phrase, which I'll, I'll, I'll quote for you now, um, where he describes how a consecration to Our Lady, the Queen of Heaven, the effect it actually has. So like, this is a real spiritual power. This is a, a spiritual reality that's absolutely not indifferent in the sight of God. So he writes, he who consecrates himself to our blessed lady, she fills with her grace, she crowns with her merits, she enlightens with her light, and she inflames with her love, and she grants them her virtue proportional to the measure in which the soul belongs to her. I'll read that again, there's a lot there, I know. Uh, but it's just, when you think of the, okay, the power of the consecration, uh, so I consecrate myself to Our Lady, and just in case there's any doubt there, consecrating ourselves to Our Lady means consecrating ourselves to Our Lady in order to get to Jesus, right? It's just so that there's no, never any confusion out there. Our Lady, she'd be the first to say that we shouldn't stop there, you know, but we, we, we go to Jesus through Mary, so we belong to Mary in order that she can bring us to Jesus. She's not a, 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 some sort of a secondary deity or something like that. Of course not. Everything that we bring to Our Lady is in order that we can get more safely, more quickly, <clears throat> more securely to Jesus. The goal is always Jesus. Just, just so that's clear. So, he who consecrates himself to Our Lady, she fills them with her grace. So Our Lady was filled with grace. Remember, filled with God, not filled with herself. So then she shares that with us. <clears throat> Fills with her grace. She crowns us with her merits. With her merits. We're crowned with her merits. Entirely undeserved from our perspective. She enlightens with her light. Because of her proximity to God, because of her oneness with God, 
She has a wisdom that goes beyond mere human wisdom, an understanding of God that goes beyond mere human understanding. She has this, this light within her due to her proximity with God. She can just irradiate this, 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 this grace and this love. So she enlightens with her light and she inflames with her love. She who carried Jesus in her womb, she who nursed him, brought him up, she who saw Jesus dying on the cross, then she who now glories in, in the beatific vision, she is, is, is as filled with love as a human being is, is, is capable of. And she shares that with us. And she grants us her virtue, you know, purity, <clears throat> faith, modesty, all of these, these virtues so needed in our world today. She grants us her virtue proportional to the measure in which the soul belongs to her. The more we belong to her, the more she communicates these virtues with us. So yes, Our Lady's foundation is, is humility, but we shouldn't think that then she's just entirely passive and just gets blown as far as the, 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 the throne of the Queen of Heaven. She works perfectly with the grace given to her, as we can and as we should, and then she shares all of this with us because none of what she's been given is just for her. She wishes to share it all with us. And so we ask our Blessed Lady to renew our faith this new year, to help us to see the privilege it is to be consecrated to her, to be protected by her, to be guided by her, to share in her merits, to be filled with her light, filled with her grace, inflamed with her love. And may she guide us to the heart of her Son, now and always. Amen.